All right, Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10 is where we're jumping into this morning. Uh, verse 38. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. What we're doing right now is, is looking at different encounters that Jesus has with different people, and when he encounters them, and when they encounter him, uh, what does that do to them? How do they leave that conversation? How do they leave knowing him? You know, this, they have this relationship that's formed between them and him, Jesus, and, and it affects them. It, it changes them somehow, and uh, that's where we're at today. So today, we're looking at two women. Martha, who we just mentioned, and her sister, Mary, who we'll talk about in, in a few moments. Now, we don't really know how they met in the beginning, Jesus and, and Mary and Martha. There's, there's ideas and everything, but no one really knows for sure or how many times maybe they've interacted before this verse that we just read where Martha invites them to her house. Uh, to, to stay. We do know they're friends. We, we do get the idea, uh, partially from this verse, that when Jesus is in Bethany and, he, and in that region, that he tends to hang out at their house. It's kind of a home base for him in that area. And uh, so, so they, they have a relationship going on here. Now, it's the next two verses we're going to read here in a moment that, that tend to cause a lot of conversation about Mary and Martha. It's from these two verses that we're going to read that, um, to be honest, I, I, I think maybe we're, we're, I say we being the, the, like the church uh, as a whole, tend to be a little unfair toward Mary and Martha because it's just this little tiny slice of their life and we've come up with like these big assessments and personality traits and profiles of who Mary and Martha is and, and, and um, just because of this encounter of Jesus. Now remember, this is a big moment in their life. They are in Encountering Jesus, right? I mean, he is the king. They believe he is the highest prophet, best, most powerful prophet ever in the history of Israel. So it's not like, hey, he's just another guy. I mean, so they're, they're kind of at a, I don't know, stress is a good word, high anxiety, high stress. Uh, they're they're kind of uh, at an alerted state when, when they see him. And we have this little slice, a couple verses we're going to read here in, in a second. And people have come up with these in-depth personalities of them. I've heard people say that, you know, there's a Mary, and, and, and I probably said this myself, to be honest, uh, through, through, <laughs> through the years. There's, there's, there's two different ways to live out your faith. Everyone should try to be a Mary. Mary's the you know, she's a great one, Martha. She, she's not so much, you know. And you make all the Marthas out there, they're fear really, really bad. Um, uh, I'm, like I say, I'm sure I've said that before. Uh, but again, I, I, I think we're maybe guilty of jumping to some pretty big assumptions, considering this is really all we know about him. I don't know if that's really what you can say about Mary's personality or Martha's personality. They came out true this way, uh, but, but they are talking to, to an important person. Uh, I remember being on vacation years ago. I don't remember, a long, long time ago. And we visited a church of some well-known preacher, and he was a big guy, and I really respected him. I used to quote him all the time, read his books, all, all that stuff, you know, the big guy, one of the big guys. And we went to the church, and we saw him, and it was a great service. And uh, Cheryl and I are leaving, and we're like, oh, it was a great day, really great, really glad got to experience this. And we're walking out, and there he is, like in the hallway, like a, like a normal person, like talking to people, it's just chatting. And we're like, oh, it's the big guy, you know? And, and it was kind of like, like this moment of what do we do? And Cheryl kind of jazzed me, go introduce yourself to him. And I'm thinking, uh, you know, I kind of get starstruck or something. I don't know what it is. I'm kind of nervous. I'm like, oh, I can't talk to him. You know, I'm just this guy, you know? And, 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 and I'm like, he's just a guy. But, but anyway, all this stuff's going through my mind. And I'm like, oh, I don't want to talk to him. And, and, and so I don't know, we had this really awkward conversation. Why don't you want to talk to him? I don't know. I want to talk to him. Why don't you just say hi? I don't want to say hi. You know? And finally, she just gives up on me, says, whatever. You know? and, and, and we go back to the car and everything. Things fine. So if you were to take this in-depth assessment and, and try to decide what our personalities are like, because of that little tiny slice, that little moment that we had with someone that was highly respected and someone who I really res, you know, respected, uh, you probably would say that, 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 well, Cheryl is obviously an extrovert and a big risk taker, right? I mean, she, <laughs> you know her. <laughs> She, she, she's afraid of nobody, could give a rip what anybody thinks about her. Her goal is to climb her way to, up the cor corporate ladder and, you know, and win it at all you know, costs and everything. She's afraid of nothing, right? And you would say, I am this meek little guy who's afraid of his own shadow and, and, and doesn't like to talk and, and doesn't like to try new things and, and never gets out of his comfort zone and never takes risks, you know, and, and I'm really worried about what people think about me, right? That, I mean, that would be pretty fair based on that little slice of, of, of life that you were to take out of it. It would be completely wrong and absolutely pretty much totally opposite <laughs> of, of reality. But that's what we've done a lot with Mary and Martha. That's why I say maybe it's a little unfair what we do to them. Here, here's, let, let's, let's jump on. Let's, let's, this, 
These are the two verses that we jump to these big conclusions on. Uh, talking about Martha in verse 39, it says, and she had a sister called Mary, okay, so we know that, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me alone to serve? Tell her to help me. So we've looked at these two verses, and, and you can read commentaries, you know, you can uh, listen to sermons. I, I listen to a couple, three sermons online. Sometimes I'll do that just, just to see what people out there are saying. And, and, and everybody was saying the same thing, and I thought, ah, I don't know if I can go there, <laughs> you know? Almost everything you hear, you hear about Mary being the super spiritual Christian who loves God. And, and she had some good qualities here, right? And, and, and loves nothing more than to sit around and, and, and hang out at the, and talk about Bible all day long and, 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 and learn. And, and she's soaking in all the wisdom that God has to offer. But if you hear about Martha, Martha's like the counter to that. She's the whiny, uh, you know, busybody who's jealous of her super spiritual sister because she's getting away with not doing all the work. And, and so there's a big conflict going on. And, and maybe we get that a little bit from the next verse because Jesus does say, well, well Mary's got a, got a point here. Uh, the Lord answered, Martha, Martha. That's an endearing term, by the way. Martha, Martha. Martha, come on. You know, I love you, Martha, right? You're anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Now, Jesus isn't saying here that, that, that Martha is bad and Mary is good. That's often the conclusion we jump to. Oh, it's bad to be a, a worker and you want to be a learner, right? That's not what he's saying here. He's not saying it's bad to clean your house and make meals and it's good to do nothing but read your Bible. Uh, pe people like to paint this picture of Martha being so concerned about, about the little things. You know, she's taking the cobwebs out of the corner because Jesus is in the house, and, and, and she's cleaning off the chandeliers, and, and, and she, you know, she's taking all the precious moments out of the counter and, you know, blowing them off with a hair hose. I, I know, she, she's doing all these little things that really don't matter and no one really pays attention to instead of listening to Jesus. But, but let's look at what's, what's really happening here. The verses we already read, if you look a little closer, just at some of the words that we kind of fly over, uh, I think it tells us a little bit. Verse 38 says that, that uh, they went on their way. Okay, this is more than, than just Jesus hanging out at the house. There's a they involved. It implies plural. Probably the, the disciples, right? The disciples, they're all hanging out together. Jesus with his disciples are in Bethany, and Martha says, hey, come on over to my house. Could be more people than just the disciples. It wasn't uncommon for other people to follow along, you know, from town to town, and then they'd kind of drift off and go back home after a while. But, but there could be quite a group of people here, and Martha has invited them into their house. That invitation would include the entourage, at least the close group that is, is with Jesus. There's a lot to do when, you know, 12 to 20 people show up at your house, right? Uh, I mean, I mean, there, there's something that has, it's not like she has a group of frozen, you know, a bunch of frozen pizzas in, in the freezer that she can just throw in the oven. I mean, there, there, there's stuff that has to be done. These are men that need to eat, they need to be refreshed, they need some water, that doesn't, she can't just turn on the water faucet. I mean, everything has to be gathered in this hot desert climate. I mean, there's a lot of work to be done just to have a handful of people in, in, uh, in their house. There's no pot roast on, on the stove cooking their meal. I mean, I mean, everything has to be prepared. Bread has to be made, meat has to be prepared if they're having meat, you know, all that stuff. I get the impression that in all of this that has to be done, Mary probably started helping Martha. Because verse 40 says that Martha says her sister had left her. That kind of gets the idea she was maybe with her. You know, she's left me to do all this stuff by myself. She left me. And, and, and now here I am working by, by myself. And the temptation is to envision uh, Mary casually sitting back, sipping on iced tea, uh, hanging out with the boys, listening to Jesus talk about the events of the day. But, but this is actually a significant posture in Scripture. When, when you see a term sitting at the feet of Jesus, she's not just hanging out, letting her sister do all the work, thinking, I got a freebie. <laughs> you know, I mean, this, this is a big thing. That is what disciples do. Disciples sit at the feet of their teacher. That is an officially designated disciple. You go to any rabbi, there are people who sit at their feet while the, while the rabbi would sit and teach, and they would be at his feet, and he'd be teaching them, and there'd be others in the background in a different crowd, but the official people would be sitting at his feet. This is what the Apostle Paul did when he received his formal training uh, back in, in the day. It's a term he uses when he talks about his credentials in Acts chapter 22. I'm a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, uh, brought up in the city, educated at the feet of his teacher there, Gamaliel, 
according to the strict man of the law, our fathers being zealous for God as you are. I mean, he said, I sat at the feet of him. Uh, that, that's it's official training. So it's much bigger than like, I don't really feel like peeling the potatoes. I'm going to hang out with Jesus. It, it, it's, she's putting herself in the place of discipleship. This is Mary walking outside the cultural societal norms of life at that time, entering into a man's world, declaring Jesus her teacher and her an official follower uh, of his. Now, what Martha is doing is legitimate. It's not like she's being less spiritual. She, she's doing exactly what society is telling her she should do. In, in, in their culture, that's what the women do. She's making the meals, she's preparing the stuff. Uh, she, she'd be doing the same thing for any group who happened to show up at the meal. She, she's loving on Jesus, serving him by taking care of his most basic needs, shelter, food, you, you know, rest, the whole, whole thing. That's her role in society. And she's honoring Jesus by, by, by doing this. So, so it's a little more than annoying to Martha that Mary isn't engaged with this, not just because she needs the help, but because she's not doing her job, her society-given job. You're breaking the norms. You, this isn't how we do things here. You know, what, what, what are you doing? But Jesus explains that, that this is this may be different, but, it, but, it, but it's all right. He said, Mary has chosen the good portion. I like how the NIV says this better, probably just because I remember it better from, from when I was younger. But um, the NIV says, uh, only one thing is needed, he's telling Martha. Only one thing's really needed here. Mary has chosen what's better. Uh, there's, there's just preparing the food, and there's sitting at my feet, becoming a disciple. Mary's chosen what's better. Interesting. I have a couple insights uh, just, just based on this encounter that I think that uh, uh, are important for us and, and maybe impact, hopefully impactful for us as well. The first thing is following Jesus can lead you contrary to societal norms. Uh, it's, you're, you're not going with the flow. You all know that, right? I mean, it's not, you, 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 know, you figured that out by now. The following Jesus isn't the easy way. It's, it's not following the crowd. It's not doing what everybody else is doing. You're going to be different than, than society. It could be in a lot of areas, um, and it certainly was here. Now, if Jesus was a typical rabbi, if he was a typical teacher, and Mary came up and was sitting at his feet while Martha was out working, he would have been like, hey, whoa, hey, oh, no, 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 no. Uh, this is for somebody else. This is for the men. The men sit here. Uh, the women do the cleaning and the cooking. You know, you, you, you go and do that. That's true in many societies today. When we were in Zimbabwe, it was very much, very much like that, very patriarchal society. It's like the women were cooking and, and the cleaning, and, and the guys got to sit around and eat. And, and you know, we talked about that before in the past. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's very common, all right? That's what, that's what a good rabbi would, would have said. But he didn't do that. He basically said, hey, let, let her stay. Uh, she's chosen with the better. He, he, he's like jumping over all of societal's norms right there. All this, the roles of women and men and all, all he, she's jumping over things. He's cho chosen the better. See, see, God's kingdom, Christianity, would not be just about middle-aged Jewish men. It'd be about women, too. It'd be about Greeks. It'd be about Gentiles. It'd be about Ethiopians. It'd be about uh, Gentiles like us. It'd be so much bigger than what society in his culture was looking for. It'd be for the wealthy. It'd be for the impoverished, just the same. It'd be for the people in powerful positions. It'd be for the people who are taking out the garbage or the po powerful people in positions. <laughs> it's for all of us. The Apostle Paul put it this way in Galatians 3, For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There's neither... Jew nor Greek. Ethnic doesn't matter. There's neither slave nor free. What you do for a living doesn't matter. How much you make, high to low, doesn't matter. There's no male, female, gender, doesn't matter. You're all one in Christ. In, in Jesus, in his kingdom, it was going to be different. We're, we're, we're just all one. We're, we're, we're all together. Freedom is for everybody. It doesn't matter what you do for a living. It doesn't matter how much education you do or don't have or what race you are. It just doesn't matter. He came to free all people of every nation, of every tribe, of every tongue, regardless of what maybe his culture even at that time really wanted him to do. They wanted him to rise up, raise up the Jews to the next you know, powerful state of the world. They, they, they wanted him to, to, to make Israel great again. He said, no, I came to make the world great. 
I came to free sin, free people. So it's important to understand about God that, that God will not be defined by culture, even the culture he was born into. He will not be defined by culture. He does not change for culture. He does not evolve with a culture's belief system. As a culture uh, decides they, they're going to change how they believe about things, he doesn't change with the culture just because the culture is changing. That may sound a little bit harsh, but here's the deal. He doesn't care what we think. He doesn't care how we feel about things. He doesn't care what we want or what we believe is true or not true. He's God, we're not. That's just how it works. That's why he gets to call the shots. He's the creator. Create your own world, then you can call the shots. But, but, but he's the creator. He's the one who calls the shots. So as followers of Jesus, when his book says to do something, we do it, right? Well, if you, if you want to, right? If you, if, if you agree with it, right? No, if, he, if this book says do it, what do you do? You do it. If this book says don't do it, right? You don't do it. Why? Because he's the boss. He's the God. Right? We're just followers. If I read something and say, eh, I'm not sure, that makes me not a follower, correct? That's real simple, right? I mean, it's a simple, simple thing. It's not really complicated. God says, do this, and I say, I'd rather not. I'm not following God. Or God says, don't do this, and I think, ah, I think I want to. I'm not following. I mean, it's, that's simple. That's a simple process. We overcomplicate things too much. But that's how it is. As followers of Jesus, book says do it, we do it. It says don't do it, we don't do it. It's that simple. Now we kind of choose to ignore it. That just makes us not followers. It's very simple. It's very simple. Jesus' teachings don't change from nation to nation. Uh, he doesn't have a different set of, of you know, standards in, in Zimbabwe that he does here. It's, just, it's the same. That, that's why we can go there and teach and they can come here and teach because it's the same Bible. It's the same God. It doesn't change from generation to generation. So someone who's young can teach the Bible. Someone who's old can teach the Bible. It's the same truth. It's, nothing, nothing has changed. His truth is consistent for all generations, for all times. There will be times when society will, will alter what they think, right? When, when here's God's word and here's what it says and society is like way over here on, on some issue, doesn't matter what the issue is, and they're saying, man, this is, all, this is what we think is true. We've evolved, we've changed, we know more than they used to. This is old and fuddy-duddy. Now, uh, who's moved? Society, right? That doesn't mean society is right and, and God is wrong. God's still right. Society just changed. It, by the way, it never, ever turns out well for the society that does that. And, and we've, you know, we've, we've read it enough that the Bible, it happens over and over and over again. I mean, it's it just generation. After, we have to keep recommitting to God, it seems like. So society can come way over here. And, and here's, here's uh, what makes this uh, a big deal, is um, in, in, in the church, we, then we have to decide, if, we're, if we call ourselves Christians, we have to decide, who do I follow? Will I sit at the feet of Jesus and do what he says, or will I sit at the feet of culture and do what the culture says? Who will I believe? Who will I chase after? Who will I sit with? Who will I fellowship with? Who will I live with? That, that's, that's, that's the difficult thing. You, are, you, are you with me? I mean, I just, it's pr pretty simple. Um, I've, I've been saying about the same thing for like 34 years. Um, I really haven't changed my message a whole lot because who am I to change the message? It's, you know, it's, it's, it's the same message, right? Uh, uh, if I've changed it, um, I need to be called on the carpet for that um, and, and, and told I've, I've drifted. But in, in 34 years, I have seen the church decline. It's about the church. Hello, more after society, and less after this. I, I, that, that break, that, there's nothing that breaks my heart more than that. Um, I, and sometimes I bang my head against the wall, and I, I, like, I'll just, I'm just going to keep saying what I say. The book says do it, do it. If it says don't do it, don't do it. <laughs> yeah, it's real simple. Um, and I don't, I don't know what to do about a, society, about a church, about the church, and I, I get part of it's natural, part of it's spiritual warfare, and it's, you know, it's all, we can talk about it all day about, about what it is, but more and more we're chasing after culture and not following Jesus. That just, and just understand, that, uh, if you're going to use terms, if you're not following Jesus and you're following culture, you're not a Christian. Yeah, but I read that one verse. Oh, okay, if you're not, okay, 
if you're not following, you're not following. If you're following the wrong thing, you're not following. Yeah, am I oversimplifying this <laughs> or overcomplicating it? <laughs> it's, it's not complicated, but, but, but it, we make it complicated. Uh, Mary sat at the feet of Jesus, and out of all the things she could follow and all the things she could be doing, she chose what's better. I mean, he, he says these things because he loves us, not, not because he's trying to be mean, you know, because uh, he loves us. Second thing, never let your to-do list interfere with an opportunity to encounter Jesus. There's a hundred legitimate things Martha was doing that day. I mean, I didn't count them, but there was a lot. <laughs> she had a lot to do, and she was doing them. There's a hundred legitimate reasons for Martha to be upset with Mary for not doing them. It had to be done. But Mary was with Jesus, and that was better. So out of the hundred things, there's one that's at the top. Sit at my feet first, Jesus is saying. Now, now you have a hundred legitimate things to do every single Sunday, or every time you have a youth group or small group, or wherever you encounter Jesus, your Bible time every day, you know, you have, there's so many, you have so many legitimate reasons to stay home from church. Uh, none of them are better than what's going on here. They might be good reasons. I mean, the yard needs raked, and, and the soccer team needs to play, and uh, whatever, whatever it is, that, you know, uh, the beach has to be visited, I don't know, <laughs> all these good things. Uh, and they're not evil and sinful and terrible. They're just not as good as sitting at the feet of Jesus. I'm not saying I'm Jesus, but the experience encountering God. It might be a song. It might be a conversation with someone. It might be a moment in a prayer room. It, might, you know, it, could, be, it could be during a teaching time. Uh, it could be in a Sunday school class. It could be in your small group. It could be in a Bible reading time you have in the early morning or late at night or whenever you do that. Uh, it, not, there's a lot of things that can take you from all that. Nothing's as good as that. Uh, and you can catch up online. It's never as good as the real thing. Because you can't have the conversations online. You know, you can't have the fellowship and, and the things that happen online. Uh, now, I know I'm, I'm, I'm meddling a little bit. Maybe a lot. Uh, but, but honestly, Mar Martha had the opportunity to sit at the feet of Jesus. She, she was there. He was there. She had the equal opportunity of Mary and chose not to. She chose to do a to-do list. And again, it was all good stuff. And Jesus responds, Mary, Mary, Mary. <laughs> Mary, I love you. Come have a seat. I want you to be a disciple too. I want you to follow me. I want you to know what this kingdom is all about. We'll have time to eat. I'm not going to starve. I'm going to be fine. We'll get water. Don't worry. The to-do list will be done. It'll get accomplished. Right now is the time to get some teaching. Come on in, Mary. Martha. Come on in, Martha. That's the only necessary thing on your to-do list. <clears throat> Am I goofing this up? We have those choices we have to make all the, all the time. Um, I, it wasn't that long ago uh, when, when Danielle, our oldest, was uh, must have been junior high, and and what she was invited to be in the, the traveling uh, softball team, right? Um, because, I don't know, the coaches saw and said, hey, you need to, we need to give you more than what you're doing now and what gives you a, soft, a traveling team. And, and, and um, uh, so we went to the meeting, and all the parents were there, and they were talking about schedules. And I'm like, well, it looks like uh, there's a lot of Sundays involved. Uh, so we really don't do Sundays. We have, we have something better on, on Sunday than uh, your softball team, which they didn't <laughs> Kind of took that little offensive. Uh, they didn't like that, uh, and they're like, and Cheryl's like, well, he's a preacher, you know, she's got to be here. And they're like, oh, okay, we got. Well, we'll we'll take her for you. <laughs> like, first of all, I'm not going to send her to a stranger to sleep in a motel over the weekend. I mean, I'm, no, we're not going to do that. And secondly, uh, we do church, which is we just do church. See, uh, softball's good. Love softball. She enjoyed softball. Everybody loved. It. I mean, who doesn't like to sit and watch softball? Right, right. right. Uh, but we got something better. Now, once, if, if, if softball can save my sins and give me eternal life, I'm in. Uh, when, when softball dies on the cross for me, I'm there. Uh, so far, we have a better offer. Uh, 
Um, now, I know she's probably going to be on the Olympic team and, and be on a Wheaties box and make millions of dollars from her softball career. Uh, no, probably not, um, especially since she didn't go on the traveling team. Uh, it, it turned out okay. It turned out okay. She, she survived, um, and, and we still did Sundays. Uh, whether I was the preacher or not was irrelevant. <laughs> it's because we have a better offer than the other legitimate, healthy, good to do things. Uh, we had something better. Now, now here, here's what's kind of cool is now she's way past that. Right? Now she leads worship at this cool church that I go to. Uh, <laughs> um, n- now she's uh, uh, coming on Sundays and, 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 uh, and it's still the better offer. Uh, there's lots of things she could be doing. Um, and most of you know her, she's saying this morning, right? <laughs> I mean, she, 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 leads, she leads worship here. And there's a lot of things she could be doing as, as an adult. She makes her own choices. Uh, uh, what you, what you, what you pro- may not know is uh, her, her job's uh, on the ninth floor at Mercy Hospital downtown. Uh, was that critical care, whatever the technical intensive care stuff, they all change the names all the time. Uh, she's in a pretty intense floor. People... You know, die a lot. Um, she, she's their their lives in her hands, and, and she's got to think quick. And she works a night shift quite often, and, and and at least once a month, that night shift's on Saturday night. And uh, um, if I worked the night shift in a pretty uh, stressful, high energy, life and death job, I'd probably want to get off work and go home and go to bed. I mean, that'd be on my list. <laughs> She has a better offer. And, and so she'll come off work, and sometimes the band's even here, kind of halfway rehearsing before she is. And then she pops in, throws on her guitar, and leads us in worship. I'm not doing that, to, I'm not trying to flower her up or anything. I'm just saying that that's, that's, that's inspiring to me. Uh, last week, I was standing in the back, and I was just being blown away by the worship. It was just, it was just a, cool, it was a cool day. It just felt like God was doing stuff. And I'm looking up at the stage, and, and I'm thinking to myself, I wonder how many people know she had only slept like two hours in the last couple of days. <laughs> you know, she, I couldn't tell. <laughs> I mean, uh, um, wow, that's crazy. I, um, and, and standing next to her was a, a guitar player who'd, who'd only slept about three hours. He was in Omaha playing, and, and he talked to me that morning. He says, do you guys have a shower here? <laughs> I'm like, well, you know, we talked about it, but it costs money, so no. And, um, and he goes, well, I always thought about just sleeping in the parking lot. <laughs> Because he actually lives in Lamoni, who still comes once a month to play. Um, and uh, so he went from Omaha to Lamoni, slept for three hours, came here uh, by 7, 7.30 uh, for rehearsal. Uh, before, and then he was helping us lead worship. And I'm saying those two people who on their to-do list uh, would probably have sleep pretty high. I, I, I don't know. I don't want over. I, I, I just, that just impressed me that they had a better offer. If you talk to both of them, they weren't, they weren't whining. They weren't like, oh, they, I mean, they, they're just like, if we have a, something better to do. Um, uh, I, w- I wonder how many times we allow something less to take our time, uh, to take us away. Um, we, ha- we have a, a simple goal here every week. Um, we want you to encounter Jesus. Now, it might be through the message, it might be through a song, it might be through a conversation, whatever, through a class. Through, 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 we just want you to encounter Jesus in, in some way. We don't have a big production, we're not super fancy, uh, you, you know, I mean, we don't put on a big show, we're not all that polished, all, all, all that stuff. Um, we, just want you to, we just want you to know Jesus. We just want you to know Jesus. Matter of fact, I, 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 I'm kind of, that's where we even tr- uh, transitioned to a table a couple years ago. Uh, because of that, I still want it to be a big flashy thing. Just let's sit down and have a conversation about Jesus, you know. Uh, and, and that's kind of the, the feel that we want to have. Uh, just a group of people sitting around, all of us at the feet of Jesus, trying to figure out how to live his life the way he wants us to live it, to follow him, trying to do the best thing. Uh, and that's my encouragement for you today, I guess. It's just, that's, that's just, there's so many things you can do in life. Just do what's best. Do what's better. Prioritize sit at the feet of Jesus, learn to follow him better, and then go out and live for him.